A Personal Anthology of Shakespeare. As You Like It. Act Two. Scene Seven. All the World's a Stage. Read for LibriVox.org by Martin Clifton. Jacquez, a pessimist, muses upon the seven ages of man. All the world's a stage, and all the men and women merely players. They have their exits and their entrances, and one man in his time plays many parts. His acts being seven ages, at first the infant, mewling and puking in the nurse's arms, and then the whining schoolboy with his satchel and shining morning face, creeping like snail unwillingly to school. And then the lover, sighing like a furnace, with a woeful ballad made to his mistress' eyebrow. Then a soldier, full of strange oaths, and bearded like a pard, jealous in honour, sudden and quick in quarrel, seeking the bubble reputation even in the cannon's mouth. And then the justice, in fair round belly with good cape on lined, with eyes severe and beard of formal cut, full of wise saws and modern instances. And so he plays his part. The sixth age shifts into the lean and slippered pantaloon, with spectacles on nose and pouch on side, his youthful hose well saved, a world too wide for his shrunk shank, and his big manly voice turning again towards childish treble, pipes and whistles in his sound. Last scene of all that ends this strange eventful history in second childishness and mere oblivion, sans teeth, sans eyes, sans taste, sans everything. End of recording. Shakespeare. Hamlet, Act One, Scene Three. To thine own self be true. Read for LibriVox.org by Martin Clifton. Polonius takes leave of Laertes with some advice. Yet here, Laertes, aboard, aboard for shame. The wind sits in the shoulder of your sail, and you are stayed for. There, my blessing with thee. And these few precepts in thy memory. Look thou character. Give thy thoughts no tongue, nor any unproportioned thought his act. Be thou familiar, but by no means vulgar. Those friends thou hast, and their adoption tried, grapple them unto thy soul with hoops of steel. But do not dull thy palm with entertainment of each new-hatched, unfledged courage. Beware of entrance to a quarrel, but being in, bear it that the opposed may beware of thee. Give every man thy ear, but few thy voice. Take each man's censure, but reserve thy judgment. Costly thy habit as thy purse can buy, but not expressed in fancy, rich, not gaudy. For the apparel oft proclaims the man, and they in France, of the best rank and station, are of a most select and generous chief in that. Neither a borrower nor a lender be, for loan oft loses both itself and friend, and borrowing dulleth edge of husbandry. This above all, to thine own self be true, and it must follow as the night the day thou canst not then be false to any man. Farewell, my blessing season this in thee. End of recording. A Personal Anthology of Shakespeare Hamlet, Act Two, Scene Two What a Piece of Work is Man Read for LibriVox.org by Martin Clifton Hamlet tells Guildenstern of his anxieties. I will tell you why. So shall my anticipation prevent your discovery and your secrecy to the king and queen molt no feather. I have of late, but wherefore I know not, lost all my mirth. Forgone all custom of exercises. And indeed it goes so heavily with my disposition that this goodly frame, the earth, seems to me a sterile promontory. This most excellent canopy, the air, look you. This brave o'erhanging firmament, this majestical roof fretted with golden fire, why it appeareth nothing to me but a foul and pestilent congregation of vapours. What a piece of work is man, how noble in reason, how infinite in faculties, in form and moving how express and admirable, in action how like an angel, in apprehension how like a god, the beauty of the world, the paragon of animals, and yet to me what is this quintessence of dust? Man delights not me, no, nor woman neither, though by your smiling you seem to say so. End of recording. A Personal Anthology of Shakespeare Hamlet, Act Three, Scene One To Be or Not To Be Read for LibriVox.org by Martin Clifton Hamlet wonders whether he should take action upon the murder of his father. 
To be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against a sea of troubles, and by opposing end them. To die, to sleep, no more, and by a sleep, to say we end the heartache and the thousand natural shocks that flesh is heir to. Tis a consummation devoutly to be wished, to die, to sleep. To sleep, perchance to dream, aye, there's the rub. For in that sleep of death what dreams may come, when we have shuffled off this mortal coil, must give us pause. There's the respect that makes calamity of so long life. For who would bear the whips and scorns of time, the oppressor's wrong, the proud man's contumely, the pangs of disprized love, the law's delay, the insolence of office, and the spurns that merit of the unworthy takes, when he himself might his quietus make with a bare bodkin? Who would fardels bear to grunt and sweat under a weary life, but that the dread of something after death, the undiscovered country, from whose bourne no traveller returns, puzzles the will, and makes us rather bear those ills we have than fly to others that we know not of? Thus conscience doth make cowards of us all, and thus the native hue of resolution is sicklied o'er with the pale cast of thought, and enterprises of great pitch and moment, with this regard, their currents turn awry, and lose the name of action. Soft you now, the fair Ophelia. Nymph, in thy orisons be all my sins remembered. End of record. Anthology of Shakespeare. Hamlet, Act Three, Scene Two. Speak the Speech. Read for LibriVox.org by Martin Clifton. Hamlet gives acting advice to a group of players. Speak the speech, I pray you, as I pronounced it to you, trippingly on the tongue. But if you mouth it, as many of your players do, I had as lief the town crier spoke my lines. Nor do not saw the air too much with your hand, thus. But use all gently, for in the very torrent, tempest, and, as I may say, whirlwind of your passion, you must acquire and beget a temperance that may give it smoothness. Oh, it offends me to the soul to hear a robustious, periwig-pated fellow tear a passion to tatters, to very rags, to split the ears of the groundlings, who for the most part are capable of nothing but inexplicable dumb shows and noise. I would have such a fellow whipped for a doing termagant. It out Herod's Herod. Pray you, avoid it. Be not too tame, neither, but let your own discretion be your tutor. Suit the action to the word, the word to the action with this special observance, that you o'erstep not the modesty of nature. For anything so o'erdone is from the purpose of playing, whose end, both at the first and now, was and is to hold as twere the mirror up to nature, to show virtue her feature, scorn her own image, and the very age and body of the time his form and pressure. Now this overdone, or come tardy off, though it makes the unskilful laugh, cannot but make the judicious grieve. The censure of the which one must, in your allowance, owe away a whole theatre of others. Oh, there be players that I have seen play, and heard others praise, and that highly, not to speak it profanely, that neither having the accent of Christians, nor the gait of Christian, pagan, nor man, have so strutted and bellowed, that I have thought some of nature's journeymen had made men, and not made them well. They imitated humanity so abominably. End of recording. A Personal Anthology of Shakespeare Julius Caesar, Act One, Scene Two Bestride the Narrow World Read for LibriVox.org by Martin Clifton Cassius discusses Caesar's rise to power with Brutus Why, man, he doth bestride the narrow world like a colossus, and we petty men walk under his huge legs, and peep about to find ourselves dishonourable graves. Men at some time are masters of their fates. The fault, dear Brutus, is not in our stars, but in ourselves that we are underlings. Brutus and Caesar, what should be in that Caesar? Why should that name be sounded more than yours? Write them together. Yours is as fair a name. Sound them. It doth become the mouth as well. Weigh them, it is as heavy. Conjure with them. Brutus will start a spirit as soon as Caesar. 
and in the name of all the gods at once, upon what meat doth this our Caesar feed that he is grown so great? Age thou art shamed, Rome thou hast lost the breed of noble bloods. When went there by an age since the great flood, but it was famed with more than with one man? When could they say, till now, that talked of Rome, that her wide walks encompassed but one man? Now it is Rome indeed, and room enough, when there is in it but one only man. O oh, you and I have heard our fathers say, there was a Brutus once that would have brooked the eternal devil to keep his state in Rome as easily as a king. End of recording. A Personal Anthology of Shakespeare Julius Caesar, Act 3, Scene 2 If you have tears, prepare to shed them now. Read for LibriVox.org by Martin Clifton Mark Antony shows Caesar's body to the crowd. If you have tears, prepare to shed them now. You all do know this mantle. I remember the first time ever Caesar put it on. It was on a summer's evening in his tent. That day he overcame the nervii. Look, in this place ran Cassius' dagger through. See what a rent the envious Casca made. Through this the well-beloved Brutus stabbed. And as he plucked his cursed steel away, mark how the blood of Caesar followed it, as rushing out of doors to be resolved if Brutus so unkindly knocked or no. For Brutus, as you know, was Caesar's angel. Judge, O oh you gods, how dearly Caesar loved him. This was the most unkindest cut of all. For when the noble Caesar saw him stab, ingratitude, more strong than traitor's arms, quite vanquished him, then burst his mighty heart and in his mantle muffling up his face, even at the base of Pompey's statue, which all the while ran blood, great Caesar fell. Oh, what a fall was there, my countrymen! Then I, and you, and all of us fell down, whilst bloody treason flourished over us. Oh, now you weep, and I perceive you feel the dint of pity. These are gracious drops. Kind souls, what weep you when you but beheld our Caesar's vesture wounded? Look you here. Here is himself marred, as you see, with traitors. End of recording. A Personal Anthology of Shakespeare Julius Caesar, Act Three, Scene Two Friends, Romans, Countrymen Read for LibriVox.org by Martin Clifton Mark Antony pays his tribute to Caesar. Friends, Romans, Countrymen, lend me your ears. I come to bury Caesar, not to praise him. The evil that men do lives after them. The good is oft interred with their bones, so let it be with Caesar. The noble Brutus hath told you Caesar was ambitious. If it were so, it was a grievous fault, and grievously hath Caesar answered it. Here, under leave of Brutus and the rest, for Brutus is an honourable man, so are they all, all honourable men, come I to speak in Caesar's funeral. He was my friend, faithful and just to me, but Brutus says he was ambitious, and Brutus is an honourable man. He hath brought many captives home to Rome, whose ransoms did the general coffers fill. Did this in Caesar seem ambitious? When the poor have cried, Caesar hath wept. Ambition should be made of sterner stuff. Yet Brutus says he was ambitious, and Brutus is an honourable man. You all did see that on the Lupercal I thrice presented him a kingly crown which he did thrice refuse. Was this ambition? Yet Brutus says he was ambitious, and sure he is an honourable man. I speak not to disprove what Brutus spoke, but here I am to speak what I do know. You all did love him once, not without cause. What cause withholds you then to mourn for him? O judgment, thou art fled to brutish beasts, and men have lost their reason. Bear with me. My heart is in the coffin there with Caesar, and I must pause till it come back to me. End of recording. A Personal Anthology of Shakespeare Julius Caesar, Act Three, Scene Two Let Me Not Stir You Up Read for LibriVox.org by Martin Clifton Mark Antony Moves the Crowd to Mutiny 
Good friends, sweet friends, let me not stir you up to such a sudden flood of mutiny. They that have done this deed are honourable. What private griefs they have, alas, I know not that made them do it. They are wise and honourable, and will no doubt with reasons answer you. I come not, friends, to steal away your hearts. I am no orator as Brutus is, but as you know me all, a plain blunt man that love my friend, and that they know full well that gave me public leave to speak of him. For I have neither wit, nor words, nor worth, action, nor utterance, nor the power of speech to stir men's blood. I only speak right on. I tell you that which you yourselves do know, show you sweet Caesar's wounds, poor, poor dumb mouths, and bid them speak for me. But were I Brutus, and Brutus Antony, there were an Antony would ruffle up your spirits, and put a tongue in every wound of Caesar, that should move the stones of Rome to rise and mutiny. End of recording. Anthology of Shakespeare Julius Caesar, Act V Scene five. This was the noblest Roman of them all. Read for LibriVox.org by Martin Clifton. Mark Antony pays tribute to Brutus, who has killed himself. This was the noblest Roman of them all. All the conspirators, save only he, did that they did in envy of great Caesar. He only, in a general honest thought and common good to all, made one of them. His life was gentle and the elements so mixed in him that nature might stand up and say to all the world, This was a man. End of recording. A Personal Anthology of Shakespeare King Henry V, Act Three, Scene One Once More Unto the Breach Read for LibriVox.org by Martin Clifton King Henry rouses his troops before Harfleur. Once more unto the breach, dear friends, once more, or close the wall up with our English dead. In peace there's nothing so becomes a man as modest stillness and humility. But when the blast of war blows in our ears, then imitate the action of the tiger. Stiffen the sinews, conjure up the blood, disguise fair nature with hard-favoured rage. Then lend the eye a terrible aspect. Let it pry through the portage of the head like the brass cannon. Let the brow o'erwhelm it as fearfully as doth a galled rock o'erhang and jutty his confounded base, swilled with the wild and wasteful ocean. Now set the teeth and stretch the nostril wide, hold hard the breath and bend up every spirit to his full height. On, on, you noble English, whose blood is fet from fathers of war proof. Fathers that, like so many Alexanders, have in these parts from morn till even fought, and sheath their swords for lack of argument. Dishonour not your mothers, now attest that those whom you call fathers did beget you. Be copy now to men of grosser blood, and teach them how to war. And you, good yeoman, whose limbs were made in England, show us here the metal of your pasture. Let us swear that you are worth your breeding, which I doubt not, for there is none of you so mean and base that hath not noble lustre in your eyes. I see you stand like greyhounds in the slips, straining upon the start. The game's afoot. Follow your spirit, and upon this charge cry, God for Harry, England, and St. George. End of recording. A Personal Anthology of Shakespeare, King Henry V, Act Four, Scene Three. This day is called the Feast of Crispian, read for LibriVox.org, by Martin Clifton. King Henry V rallies his troops to face the French. This day is called the Feast of Crispian. He that outlives this day and comes safe home will stand a tiptoe when this day is named, and rouse him at the name of Crispian. He that shall see this day and live old age will yearly on the vigil feast his neighbours, and say, To-morrow is St. Crispian. Then will he strip his sleeve and show his scars, and say, These wounds I had on Crispian's day. Old men forget. Yet all shall be forgot, but he'll remember, with advantages, what fears he did that day. Then shall our names, familiar in his mouth as household words, Harry the King, Bedford and Exeter, Warwick and Talbot, Salisbury and Gloucester, be in their flowing cups freshly remembered. This story shall the good man teach his son, and Crispin Crispian shall ne'er go by, from this day to the ending of the world, but we in it shall be remembered, we few, we happy few, we band of brothers. 
For he to-day that sheds his blood with me shall be my brother. Be he ne'er so vile, this day shall gentle his condition. And gentlemen in England now abed shall think themselves accursed they were not here, and hold their manhoods cheap, whilst any speaks that fought with us upon St. Crispin's day. End of recording. A Personal Anthology of Shakespeare King Richard the Third, Act One, Scene One Now is the Winter of Our Discontent Read for LibriVox.org by Martin Clifton Richard announces his determination to prove a villain. Now is the winter of our discontent, made glorious summer by this son of York and all the clouds that lowered upon our house in the deep bosom of the ocean buried. Now are our brows bound with victorious wreaths, our bruised arms hung up for monuments, our stern alarums changed to merry meetings, our dreadful marches to delightful measures. Grim-visaged war hath smoothed his wrinkled front, and now, instead of mounting barbed steeds to fright the souls of fearful adversaries, he capers nimbly in a lady's chamber to the lascivious pleasing of a lute. But I that am not shaped for sportive tricks, nor made to court an amorous looking-glass, I that am rudely stamped, and want love's majesty to strut before a wanton ambling nymph, I that am curtailed of this fair proportion, cheated of feature by dissembling nature, deformed, unfinished, sent before my time into this breathing world scarce half made up, and that so lamely and unfashionable that dogs bark at me as I halt by them, why I, in this weak piping time of peace, have no delight to pass away the time, unless to spy my shadow in the sun, and descant on mine own deformity. And therefore, since I cannot prove a lover to entertain these fair well-spoken days, I am determined to prove a villain, and hate the idle pleasure of these days. Plots have I laid, inductions dangerous, by drunken prophecies, libels, and dreams, to set my brother Clarence and the King in deadly hate, the one against the other. And if King Edward be as true and just as I am subtle, false, and treacherous, this day should Clarence closely be mewed up about a prophecy which says that G of Edward's heirs the murderer will be. Dive thoughts down to my soul, here Clarence comes. End of recording A Personal Anthology of Shakespeare Macbeth Act One, Scene One, If It Were Done, read for LibriVox.org by Martin Clifton. Macbeth anguishes over his proposed murder of Duncan. If it were done, when tis done, then for well it were done quickly. If the assassination could trammel up the consequence, and catch with Circe's success, that but this blow might be the be-all and end-all, here. But here, upon this bank and shoal of time, we'd jump the life to come. But in these cases we still have judgment here, that we but teach bloody instructions, which, being taught, return to plague the inventor. This even-handed justice commends the ingredients of our poisoned chalice to our own lips. He's here in double trust. First I am his kinsman and his subject, strong both against the deed, then as his host, who should against his murderer shut the door, not bear the knife myself. Besides, this Duncan hath borne his faculties so meek, hath been so clear in his great office, that his virtues will plead like angels, trumpet-tongued against the deep damnation of his taking off. And pity, like a naked new-born babe, striding the blast, or heaven's cherubins, horsed upon the sightless couriers of the air, shall blow the horrid deed in every eye that tears shall drown the wind. I have no spur to prick the sides of my intent, but only vaulting ambition, which o'erleaps itself and falls on the other. End of recording. Anthology of Shakespeare Macbeth, Act Two, Scene One Is This a Dagger? Read for LibriVox.org by Martin Clifton Macbeth prepares himself to murder Duncan. Is this a dagger which I see before me, the handle toward my hand? Come, let me clutch thee. I have thee not, and yet I see thee still. 
Art thou not, fatal vision, sensible to feeling as to sight? Or art thou but a dagger of the mind, a false creation, proceeding from the heat-oppressed brain? I see thee yet in form as palpable as this which now I draw. Thou marshalst me the way that I was going, and such an instrument I was to use. Mine eyes are made the fools of the other senses, or else worth all the rest. I see thee still, and on thy blade and dudgeon gouts of blood, which was not so before. There's no such thing. It is the bloody business which informs us to mine eyes. Now o'er the one half-world nature seems dead, and wicked dreams abuse the curtained sleep. Witchcraft celebrates pale Hecate's offerings, and withered murder alarmed by his sentinel, the wolf, whose howls his watch, thus with his stealthy pace, with Tarquin's ravishing strides towards his design. Whose howls his watch, thus with his stealthy pace, with Tarquin's ravishing strides towards his design, moves like a ghost. Thou sure and firm set earth, hear not my steps, which way they walk, for fear thy very stones prate of my whereabout, and take the present horror from the time, which now suits with it. Whilst I threat, he lives. Words to the heat of deeds too cold breath gives. I go, and it is done, the bell invites me. Hear it not, Duncan, for it is a knell that summons thee to heaven or to hell. End of recording. A Personal Anthology of Shakespeare, The Merchant of Venice, Act One, Scene Three, Many a Time and Oft, read for LibriVox.org by Martin Clifton. Shylock berates Antonio for his previous behaviour towards him. Signor Antonio, many a time and oft in the Rialto you have rated me about my monies and my usances. Still have I borne it with a patient shrug, for sufferance is the badge of all our tribe. You call me misbeliever, cutthroat dog, and spet upon my Jewish gabardine, and all for use of that which is mine own. Well, then, it now appears you need my help. Go to, then. You come to me, and you say, Shylock, we would have monies, you say so. You that did void your room upon my beard, and foot me as you spurn a stranger cur over your threshold, monies is your suit. What should I say to you? Should I not say, half a dog money? Is it possible a cur can lend three thousand ducats? Or shall I bend low, and in a bondman's key, with bated breath and whispering humbleness, say this, Fair sir, you spet upon me Wednesday last, you spurned me such a day, another time you called me dog, and for these courtesies I'll lend you thus much monies. End of recording. A Personal Anthology of Shakespeare, The Merchant of Venice, Act Three, Scene One, If You Prick Us Do We Not Bleed, read for LibriVox.org by Martin Clifton. Silerio asks Shylock why he has asked for a pound of flesh. Why, I'm sure if he forfeit they will not take his flesh, what's that good for? To bait fish withal. If it will feed nothing else, it will feed my revenge. He hath disgraced me, and hindered me half a million, laughed at my losses, mocked at my gains, scorned my nation, thwarted my bargains, cooled my friends, heated mine enemies, and what's his reason? I am a Jew. Hath not a Jew eyes? Hath not a Jew hands, organs, dimensions, senses, affections, passions, fed with the same food, hurt with the same weapons, subject to the same diseases, healed by the same means, warmed and cooled by the same winter and summer as a Christian is? If you prick us, do we not bleed? If you tickle us, do we not laugh? If you poison us, do we not die? And if you wrong us, shall we not revenge? If we are like you in the rest, we will resemble you in that. If a Jew wrong a Christian, what is his humility? Revenge. If a Christian wrong a Jew, what should his sufferance be by Christian example? Why, revenge, the villainy you teach me I will execute, and it shall go hard, but I will better the instruction. End. A Personal Anthology of Shakespeare The Merchant of Venice, Act 4, Scene 1 The Quality of Mercy Read for LibriVox.org by Martin Clifton Portia argues for a show of mercy 
The quality of mercy is not strained. It droppeth as a gentle rain from heaven upon the place beneath. It is twice blessed. It blesseth him that gives and him that takes. It is mightiest in the mightiest. It becomes the throned monarch better than his crown. His scepter shows the force of temporal power, the attribute to awe and majesty wherein doth sit the dread and fear of kings. But mercy is above this sceptered sway. It is enthroned in the hearts of kings. It is an attribute to God himself. And earthly power doth then show likest gods, when mercy seasons justice. Therefore, Jew, though justice be thy plea, consider this, that in the course of justice none of us should see salvation. We do pray for mercy, and that same prayer doth teach us all to render the deeds of mercy. I have spoken thus much to mitigate the justice of thy plea, which, if thou follow, this strict court of Venice must needs give sentence against the merchant here. End of recording. A Personal Anthology of Shakespeare Romeo and Juliet, Act 2, Scene 2 What Light Through Yonder Window Breaks Read for LibriVox.org by Martin Clifton Romeo sees Juliet on her balcony But soft, what light through yonder window breaks? It is the east, and Juliet is the sun. Arise, fair sun, and kill the envious moon, Who is already sick and pale with grief, That thou, her maid, art far more fair than she. Be not her maid, since she is envious, Her vestal livery is but sick and green, And none but fools do wear it. Cast it off. It is my lady, oh, it is my love, Oh, that she knew she were. She speaks, yet she says nothing. What of that? Her eye discourses. I will answer it. I am too bold. Tis not to me she speaks. Two of the fairest stars in all the heavens, having some business, do entreat her eyes to twinkle in their spheres till they return. What if her eyes were there, they in her head? The brightness of her cheek would shame those stars, as daylight doth a lamp. Her eyes in heaven would through the airy region stream so bright, that birds would sing and think it were not night. See how she leans her cheek upon her hand. Oh, that I were a glove upon that hand, that I might touch that cheek. End of recording. A Personal Anthology of Shakespeare Romeo and Juliet, Act 2, Scene 2 Romeo, Romeo Read for LibriVox.org by Martin Clifton Juliet expresses her anxiety that Romeo is a Montague whilst she is a Capulet. O Romeo, Romeo, wherefore art thou Romeo? Deny thy father, and refuse thy name, or if thou wilt not, be but sworn my love, and I'll no longer be a Capulet. Tis but thy name that is my enemy. Thou art thyself, though not a Montague. What's Montague? It is not hand, nor foot, nor arm, nor face, nor any other part belonging to a man. O oh, be some other name. What's in a name? That which we call a rose by any other word would smell as sweet. So Romeo would, were he not Romeo called, retain that dear perfection which he owes without that title. Romeo, doff thy name, and for thy name, which is no part of thee, take all myself. 